in thy way from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. We can turn to Revelation 7 to kind of get our thoughts started here. I was telling Brother Larry last week I had downloaded an audio Bible and listened to that while I delivered the mail. I get a lot of things I like to I like to look into and study as I listen to it. A lot about teaching on Samson and how he was not as good with women. <laughs> he called his first wife a heifer. <laughs> Just he did seriously though. Yeah. <laughs> He, the Philistines tricked her into giving up the answer to his riddle, and he said, Will you plow with my heifer? <laughs> yeah. so we're going to look at angels, Lord willing, this morning. We'll start in Revelation 7, verse 11. <clears throat> it says, And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne of, on their faces and worshipped God saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and light be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Well, we'd like to look at this topic of angels, because it's one that's not very well understood. In our, right. Uh, well, after studying it, I realized I probably need a whole other week to figure all this out. But mm -hmm. We'll try to do our best to give an overview here. As we see here in this text the angels worship God around the throne. That's one right. of their, their chief means to do. The, the word angel primarily means messenger in both the Hebrew and the Greek. And as we see throughout the scriptures, oftentimes they are sent as messengers or as those that do the bidding of God. All throughout Revelation, the, the angels are called to open the scrolls or to pour out the vials or mm -hmm. the angels are at least the ones that are still around the throne of God they do the bidding of God Amen. Well, scripture doesn't say exactly when they were created in Genesis 2 1 it tells us that it says and thus the heavens and the earth we're finishing all the host of them, so that must include the angels. Amen. Uh, some theorize that, based on Job 20 or 38, that the angels were already there, but that seems to be a weak interpretation of that. So it mentions you know, who was there when he created the earth, who was there when the sons of God shouted for joy and the morning stars rejoiced. But Exodus 20, verse 11, says very explicitly that all things in heaven and earth were created in six days. Mm -hmm. well, at some point in that six days of creation, God created the angels. Mm -hmm. now, Satan aside, the first time we encounter human encounter angels is in Genesis 16, after with Hagar. You can turn over there and read the account real quick, but... Really, up until this point, and the Lord had oftentimes spoken directly to His people. But Revelation, excuse me, Genesis 16, verse 7. Hagar had been dealt hardly, as the Scripture says, by Sarah. And it says, "An angel of the Lord found her by a fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way." To sure, and he said, Hey, Ar, Sarah's camp, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hand. Mm -hmm. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for a multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, Thou art with child, thou shalt bear a son, thou shalt call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. And he will be a wild man, his hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. 
here we see this angel of the Lord comes out with a message from God for Hagar. Mm -hmm. But we can get a lot in the details of Hagar and Ishmael and what problems that is and still is today. But this is the first interaction we see of after the fall with man and angels and they're giving a message to us. Mm -hmm. so the scripture, the New Testament says in Hebrews 13, 2, and be not for, forgetful to entertain angels for their body to entertain, or excuse me, to entertain strangers for you entertain angels unaware. Right. right. So I don't know. I'm assuming angels must take on the form of men sometimes. And they come by our way and we don't even realize it. Right. We should be careful how we treat strangers. Mm -hmm. We should be careful how we really treat everyone. Right. We never know who we might be dealing with. Mm -hmm. We see that they are all around us. We remember second teens. This is not as Explicit of a reference, but Second Kings chapter six. I know I made mention of it, and Adam has as well. You know, the the series, I think it was, where they were coming down to to destroy Elisha and the serpent. We'll pick up here in verse 15. So there was a large army of horses and chariots coming upon them, and the serpent says, When the serpent of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host of the past city, both with horses and chariots, and his serpent said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? And he, speaking of Elisha, Answer, fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Amen. Now, Elisha didn't have a, a standing army speaking. He didn't have a group of men at his disposal to command, but that he says, them that be with us are more than they that be with them. Continue reading here in verse 17. It says, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eye that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire around about Elisha. Amen. There was a spiritual realm around, and the servant wasn't even aware of it. No doubt this was angelic beings of some sort. Mm -hmm. Yet they are all around us all the time, I'd say. We Try. probably would be fearful if we actually could physically see You're right. what was going on in the spiritual realm. We also see in 2 Peter 2, 4, we don't turn there, but that angels can sin. It says, God spare not the angels that sin, but cast them down. Right. We'll get into Satan here in just a few minutes, but he is one of those angels that sinned. You're right. Now we have at least Two classes of angels mentioned in the scriptures. We have the cherubim and the seraphim. I think there are those, and then probably just the regular angels. The Bible speaks of archangels. We'll try to look at what the Bible says about each of these. Cherubim are actually mentioned more than any other. We see them first in Genesis 3:24 when God sent cherubim to guard the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve were cast out. So they were there. So it was a flaming sword. No lamb could enter back into the garden. Mm -hmm. But we see once again they were there to do the bidding of God. That was the guard of the garden. It's said of God that He dwells between the cherubims. And Psalm 99 1. And when Hezekiah prayed, he addressed God as Him who dwells between the cherubims. And 2 Kings 19.5. So there does seem to be cherubims around the thrones. Mm -hmm. so we see in the, the temple and in the uh, 
tabernacle. There were cherubims around the ark of God and the mercy seat. Turn over to Exodus chapter 25. We can read here of the tabernacle, which I know you're all probably familiar with this from Adam's study, but that's been a few years back, I think. Mm -hmm. Exodus 25. Beginning in verse 18, here God gives the command to Moses and says, Thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, a beaten work, thou shalt make them in the two ends of the mercy seat, and make one cherubim on the one end and the other cherubim on the other end, even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. Just by the way, cherub is one of these, and cherubims is the plural form. Verse 20 says, And cherubims shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one to another toward the mercy seat, shall the faces of the cherubims be. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony for that I shall give thee. And there will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment of the children of Israel. Amen. So here we see there will be these two cherubim kind of overshadowing the ark of God, the, the mercy seat. It seems to be a picture of the throne of God in heaven. Now here it says they, they stretched forth their wings and they covered it and they looked upon one another. When we go over to uh, First Kings, we see in Solomon's temple that he had the same thing. A slightly different description, though. First Kings chapter six. And he goes on to say, in five, excuse me, and the other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubims were of one measure and of one size. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it of the other cherub. And he set the cherubims within the inner house, and they stretched forth the wings of the cherubim so that the wing of the one touched the wall, one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. And he overlaid the cherubim. Gold. In this description, we're only told about two wings with, that are stretched out 15 feet for each chair. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot different than the little Roman Catholic angels you see. Right. And nowhere in any of these descriptions do we see a little halo of other heads. Right. But it does seem to be that they had at least two wings. We see, we'll see the seraphims, they had more than two. Go over to Ezekiel chapter 10, he gives a very interesting description of the cherubim. I'm not sure I fully understand all that's going on in this chapter, but. Ezekiel chapter 10. Let's 
Essentially, the whole chapter here describes them, but we'll just begin in verse 1 and read on down through here. It says, Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. I think this is the cherubim up around the throne of God. Mm -hmm. It says, And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go on between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house, and the man went in, and the clouds filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub, and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the cherubim's wing was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaketh. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, Take fire from the wheels from between the cherubims, that he went in and stood beside the wheels. And one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims under the fire that was between the cherubims. Here's these cherubims here have hands. Mm -hmm. They were able to stretch forth. And it says, He took thereof and put it into the hand of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went on. And there appeared in the cherubim in the form of a man's hand under their wings. So I hope they have a little arm and hand underneath their wings, or mm -hmm. that doesn't seem to be the way he described it here. Right. And it says, When I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub, and another wheel by one. Another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. Now, all these wheels, I'm not sure if it was part of their being or something they used. But we can see man didn't invent the wheel, God already had it. Right. It says, as for their appearance, those first ten, they had, and they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. And when they went, they went up on their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place where they, the head looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. Their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. And as for the wheels, it was cried unto them, them my hearing, O wheels. And everyone had four faces. Hmm. The first face was the face of a cherub, and the second of the face of of a man, the third the base of a lion, and the fourth the base of an eagle. Hmm. We see this interesting description here. They were first off, they had these wheels, whatever they were exactly. I'm not quite certain, but and it said they went up on their four sides and they didn't turn their heads. They just went and almost like a soldier. You ever watch right. a soldier in? Doing their duties, such as the one of the two of the unknown soldiers. Mm -hmm. They don't turn about and look around. Anymore. They're very stiff in their appearance. Mm -hmm. And so, what with these cherubims here? It says they had eyes all about them, all over their bodies, all over their wings. And that they had four faces. Not sure if it was one head with a face on each side or four different faces throughout, but I'm sure it was difficult for Ezekiel to describe to us. Right. The spiritual things are often hard to describe in the physical manner. Amen. Mm -hmm. so just using your imaginations, these will certainly be interesting creatures to look upon. There is a description also in Revelation 7. It's unclear if it's a seraphim or the cherub, so we can go Go ahead over there and read this. Without getting too ahead of myself, the seraphims are only mentioned in chapter 6 of Isaiah by name. Revelation chapter 4. Verses 7 and 8 here describe these beasts. As John calls them, and he says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Mm -hmm. 
And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes with him. So that sounds as six wings sounds like the seraphims, and right. full of eyes sounds like the cherubims. And they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And that was a chant of the seraphims, as we'll see. Amen. And it says, And when these hosts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. Well, here we have these creatures that had six wings and eyes, and they cried, Holy, 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 unto the Lord. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is another reference to cherubims or seraphims, but certainly seems to be some angelic being. Right. Uh, the most famous of the cherubims was Satan. As we'll go back to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, we'll we're given a very detailed description of him. Don't have to turn over there, but 2 Corinthians 11 14 tells us that he is trans he can't transform himself into angel of light. So Amen. He can't change his appearance to look like something good. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 28 verses 12 through 19. It well, starts out saying, Son of man, take up the lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and saying to him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum of wisdom and perfect. Thou sealest up the sum full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Well, probably saying, Well, that's not that's talking about some king, but when we see the rest of the context here, it appears he's referring to Satan. Right. Verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Only people. We know that we're there with Adam and Eve and God and Satan. Amen. Certainly, this, certainly a king thousands of years later was not there. But then he gives on this description of him. He said, Every precious stone was thy covering the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy taverns and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that they. That thou wast created. Mm -hmm. We see here he is this very beautiful creature with covered in all these precious stones. Then it mentions he has tablets and pipes. So it had some sort of musical element to his being. Right. Some of us suppose that he was the chief musician in heaven. And certainly he uses music today. Amen. Hey, man. Verse 14, though says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. It was God that gave him his position. And then he, according to Isaiah, got a little proud of himself and thought he could rise up against God and above God. Right. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created. Till iniquity was found in thee. That's another reason why I think it was. This is referring to Satan. No man was, mm -hmm. other than Adam was created perfect. But he was perfect until he sinned. Mm -hmm. Just as we mentioned in 2 Peter 2, the angels can sin. Amen. Then he goes on to say, By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the Missed of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as a profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. That sounds like the same curse that God pronounced upon Lucifer. Amen. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuary by the multitude of thy iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore, while I bring forth the fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Amen. Then one day Satan will be destroyed. You are right. But he was created this beautiful angel, and yet he sinned against God. And though he had this. Seemingly a position, a very high 
very high position in the angels that he it's called a cherubim that covereth that he had all these precious stones about him and these tablets and pipes it says he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty and yet that was not enough for Satan and he sinned and was cast down right some think the or revelation when it talks about the dragon that struck down a third of the stars with his tail that's referring to Satan and the fallen angels it certainly could be I'm not sure because mm -hmm. he does have a, a crew of fallen angels with him Amen. And were cast out in his rebellion. Amen. We'll go look at Isaiah 6 and the seraphims here that we've been alluding to. So I don't, I'm inclined to believe those in Revelation 4 might have been seraphims. They're not told very much about these type of angels. I know we. Brother Larry has read this several times in our presence, but we'll look simply at the seraphims here in Isaiah 6. We get into verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne on high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Amen. So here we see, much like those in Revelation 4, they cried, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And certainly he is holy. My personal opinion is there's a holy for each of the members of the Godhead. Hmm. Holy is the Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Holy Ghost. Amen. But here where these had these six wings, they covered their face, they covered their feet, so they had a face and they had feet. And the twain they did fly, it says. Yes, the angels can fly according the scriptures. Amen. Fact, I didn't write this reference down, but I think it's in Samuel and in one of the Psalms that refers to God as flying up on a chair. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that works out exactly, but God does use <coughs> angels for his bidding and his purposes. Mm -hmm. Here we see one of the main purposes of the angels is to, to, to really to worship him and to bring glory and honor to him. Amen. As they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. We see that we saw that in Revelation 7 back in our text, and again in Revelation 4, that's what they do. They worship God, they call down before Him continually, day and night. But really much like we will do when we are with Him forever. Amen. But these seraphims here, they're much different than again the little angel you see with halos and two little wings. Right. These apparently would have wings either big enough to position right that they could cover their face and cover their feet and still fly with the other two. That's it. So I don't know if they have the, the form of a man in a general sense or if they had some other form. Scriptures really don't tell us much. Right. And it seems that when scripture is silent or when scripture is doesn't give us much detail. Man likes to fill in the holes with his there imagination. There you go. Amen. And that's the best you'll ever get is the imagination of man. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way. Now we'll look for just a moment at the archangels. There's actually only one angel in all of Scripture that's mentioned as an archangel. That's Michael. Gabriel's often accepted as being an archangel as well. The apocryphal book of the book of Enoch mentions several different archangels. But Michael, go to Jude for a moment. Jude chapter one, or I guess there's only one chapter. Jude, verse nine. Michael the archangel, 
When contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. There's not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Amen. And here we see Michael is, call it an archangel. He is really the leader of the angels, or at least a group of angels. Mm-hmm. If we turn over to Revelation chapter 12, we'll see Michael mentioned again. Here, he's fighting with the devil. It says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. And prevailed not, neither was there a plate found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Amen. Here we, we see some. I don't know what time this war took place, but yeah, at some point Michael fought with Satan and Satan was cast out. Right. So you know, now this happened at the time that Satan thought he could become God or better than God. But Michael defended the throne, if you will. That Satan and all that rebelled with him were cast out. Right. And it was apparently at some other point him and Satan had another dispute over the body of Moses. It doesn't really give us much description of what this disputing was, but they were disputing about Moses' body after he had died, apparently. And Michael just did what we sh- we all should respond to Satan with, the Lord rebuked him. Mm-hmm. Michael is mentioned again Daniel's chapter 10 and 12, we want to turn there. Michael came to Daniel. Uh, Cable was also mentioned in the book of Daniel, chapters 8 and chapter 9. He also came to Daniel to help him, to give him the message of God. Mm-hmm. Gabriel appears to Zacharias in Luke chapter 1, verse 19, to tell him that Elizabeth was going to be with child. And then again to Mary and a few verses later, in verses 26 and 27, to tell her she was going to be with child of the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. It does appear Michael primarily is in the Old Testament, Gabriel primarily in the New Testament. We do know uh, there's going to be the, the shout and the voice of the archangel at the catching away. Amen. First Thessalonians 4, 16. Well, I don't know if if Michael is the archangel, or Michael and Gabriel are both archangels of equal authority, the scriptures don't tell us much. Right. Like I said, the, the apocryphal books where the Catholics get their other archangels from. Hmm. But there's no mention of them anywhere else in the scriptures. This is by no means an exhaustive to look at angels. There's both two scriptures that talk about the angels in general. Right. But all throughout the scriptures we see they're doing the bidding of God. When the angels came to uh, Lot, well, there's some discussion whether that was literally the God himself and the form of man, or that was some angels Either which way they appeared as men. Right. The, city, the men of the city said, bring out these men to us. Mm. We see Jacob, he wrestled with it, with an angel, or perhaps God himself. So it appears these angels can't take on a physical form, but no doubt they're around us spiritually all the time. Mm-hmm. He said one place, I think primarily referring to Christ, but it could be applicable to all of us. He says, He gave His angels charge over thee, thou shalt not dash thy foot against the stone. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we necessarily have this guardian angel that's flying around us all the time, but I'm sure God's angels are oftentimes protecting us in ways we don't see. Mm-hmm. So this is a, like a deep, deeper subject than most people want to 
think of fun and most people think of well, the angels is not really important, but everything in scripture is important. You're right. Amen. And I'm sure we'll have a a better understanding of it when we get to heaven. But the gospels say that there is rejoicing among the angels of God when the one sinner repents. Amen. So certainly these angels must be able to tell something of what's going on down here. We know that you know, the first Corinthians 11 that tells us that we're talking about the head covering that it's for the angels. That's whether that means the pastor or the angels are watching over us and right learning from us. I'm, I'm sure. I do think they watch over us and see or learn more about God from the way we interact with Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But the angels of heaven, they don't experience His mercy and grace. Right. But they do experience His full glory and honor. Something that one day we will experience, but yet we haven't. And that's one way we as humans are better than angels, if I could say it that way. That it might not seem like it, but we get to experience here His mercy, His grace, His love, His good, His kindness. And one day we'll experience all of His glory. With angels, all they have is just all of His glory, which is probably sufficient anyway. But they don't, they can only look down and see our interactions with His grace and His mercy and such. So he, it was, Christ said that in the garden, it wasn't on the cross, that some people mistake that He could have called 10 millions of angels to right. deliver Him. But certainly even the angels were at the bidding of Christ during His earthly ministry. Amen. There's one thing that angels have better than us, I guess. They are completely submissive to His bidding. Amen. Aside from the ones that sinned and were cast down. But I say even them are doing the bidding of God but in a different sense. Devils. You know, scripture uses the word devils or unclean spirits. That's really the fallen angels. Mm -hmm. The devils also believe and tremble. The scripture says mm -hmm. they died to God. They were in his presence at one time. <clears throat> That's not enough to save them. There is no salvation for the angels. Amen. Thanks be to God, there is salvation for us. Amen. Just we'll go ahead and close with that thought. Like I said, hope I didn't confuse everyone with all these different yeah. descriptions of the angels, but maybe I can clear up what the scriptures have to say about them. Thank you. Amen.